Welcome to Microphones 101. I'm Pro Voice Guy Chuck Fresh. No, that's not my real name. Witness Protection. Now, if you're considering a career as a radio DJ, a podcaster, a voiceover actor, then this is pretty important. So here's my TED-ish talk on microphones. Now, in my voiceover coaching sessions, I get a lot of questions about choosing the right microphone. And what is it? And one size does not fit all. Rather than repeat myself 200 more times, I've decided to create a video with all that information. And then I'll tell you what microphone I'm using to record this. Sounds pretty good, right? But it's probably not what you think. So stand by towards the end of this thing. I'll let you know the secret. Now, I have a lot of microphones. And there's a reason for that. First, I was a DJ. Then I was in a band. Later, I transitioned into a professional voiceover career. Then I went back to radio broadcasting and podcasting. Then I dabbled in filmmaking. So over the course of this crazy life I've lived, I've accumulated a bunch of microphones. The thing is, they all do the same exact thing. They capture sound. But it's the kind of sound that you want to capture and the specific feel of that sound that makes all the difference in choosing the right microphone for you and what you want to do. So let's dig into Microphones 101. I've got a couple of disclaimers here. Now, you'll meet a lot of, a lot of purists in this industry, like a lot of them. And I'm not going to lie, some of them are outright jerks. They'll recommend the most expensive microphones and pretend to know everything about everything to try to discourage you. And there's a reason for that. Well, a couple of reasons. So my most popular guesses are, One, they're trying to discourage or dissuade you because they don't want you to eat their lunch. They don't want you to become their competition. You probably have a better voice than some of them, and they feel threatened, so they don't want you to quit your day job. You know what I'm talking about. And two, they've probably spent upwards of $100,000 at some online sailing school. See what I did there? And they were brainwashed into their opinions by somebody else who spent $100,000. You know what I'm saying. It's just... I don't know. The truth is, some of the most important recorded audio of all time was recorded on some pretty obnoxious microphones. Listen. I have a dream. That's one small step for man. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the... Man, I'm really craving some cupcakes tonight. See? But yes, the microphone you choose is important. But what's probably more important is, number one, where you're recording. And number two, your overall technique. And I'll explain why throughout this talk, why those two things are are crucially important in selecting your microphone. All right, introduction to microphones. The first thing you'll need to know is how these microphones work. I won't bore you with all the logarithmic equations and particle physics everyone else talks about because it's boring. Honestly, you don't need to know all that stuff. It's on the box and on the web if you ever want to do that. But here are the basics, kind of probably oversimplified, but all you need to know. Sound that you're hearing right now originates in the analog world. A sound is a vibration that propagates as an acoustic wave through a transmission medium such as gas, liquid, or even solids. In the case of this microphone choosing situation, we're talking air, which is mostly gas. The sound most humans can perceive ranges from waves of about 20 hertz, which if you could see it, would look like a collection of some 50-foot strings continuously waving or oscillating in the air, to about 20,000 hertz, which would be the same string waving in the air, but a much tighter, probably about a half-inch intervals. Some animals can even hear higher frequencies. Some children can hear higher frequencies that adults can't hear. So think dog whistles, real high-pitched things. So for the purposes of this discussion, an adult human voice during normal conversation ranges from about 80 hertz to about 300 hertz. Below and above those ranges are what's known as harmonics. And those frequencies are important because that's what makes your voice sound real. Harmonics, brightness, and air can range towards the higher end of the audible spectrum between 10 to 15,000 hertz or 10 to 15 kilohertz for those playing along at home. Kilo means 1,000. Americans don't know that. Most pro mics are capable of capturing the full range of human hearing from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, so that's usually not a problem. If it doesn't capture 20 hertz at the bottom, 40 is okay too. Now, there are some problematic areas in frequencies, like the popping of P's and B's, and the clicking of hard C's and K. 
K's and the sibilance of S or Z sounds. Now, a lot of that can be removed before it's recorded with speech practice and good recording techniques. It's also possible to remove a lot of that mess after it's recorded with equalization while mastering the recording. So it's not the end of the world if it does get into your recording. And it is important to realize that all voices are monaural or mono. Yes, you can record in stereo if you want, but a single voice doesn't pr produce left and right signals. If you're recording multiple voices at once, like a choir or a bunch of singers, then stereo might be kind of cool because stereo is left and right, two signals. Remember, to record stereo, you will need at least two microphones, one for the left channel, one for the right channel. Most professional mics are mono, one channel, and that's really all you need. And then there's loudness, which is a way to measure sound pressure levels. The higher the pressure, the louder the sound. SPLs are measured in a logarithmic scale called decibels. There's a special weighted method you'll see listed as DBA, which indicates how loud a sound of a certain microphone can capture before it distorts. Now, if you're a loud talker and you find yourself screaming into a microphone, you'll probably want a microphone with a higher maximum SPL DBA rating. The $1,200 Neumann TLM-103 can probably handle a jet engine at a short distance without distorting, so to sound good and natural, you'll need to choose the right microphone that best and most naturally captures you, the way you speak, the way you sing, while avoiding the problem areas. And the right microphone might not necessarily be the most expensive. I found that they're usually not. So let's talk about how microphones work. I'm not going to get into the craziness about this. We'll just talk about the overview. Uh, microphones pick up sound. They pick up your voice. Now, there's something called a polar pattern. It's the sensitivity of sound being picked up from different directions surrounding the microphone. So think a microphone is like spherical, like the Earth. There's a North Pole and a South Pole and a whole lot of space in between. The polar pattern is really the microphone's capture area. Now, all microphone diaphragms, the thing that actually captures the sound, are built a little different, and the polar pattern for each can vary. That pattern affects how much sound the microphone collects and from which directions around the diaphragm. It's a little weird, right? There's three basic types. Cardioid, which is unidirectional, which is what this is to avoid outside noise. It doesn't record from back here. It just says, I'll take you straight on, and that's it. There's a figure eight, which is bidirectional. If you have two people across the table for an interview, they used that in the old school day. And then there's omni, which is aridirectional, which picks up every darn thing. Best for recording nature or a whole bunch of people or orchestras or rain or something. I don't know. Now, the size or the shape of the pickup patterns can vary, and some are, mics are switchable. For voiceover, you should always opt for cardioid to avoid as much background noise as possible. You don't want all this. Some people use a shotgun mic like this, seen when filming televisions or movies, and those are extremely unidirectional. It picks up one little area, throws out the rest of the sound. Now, there are two types of pickups used in microphones, dynamic and condenser. The main difference is how they work. Dynamic microphones turn sound waves into a voltage with the use of a magnet, kind of like a speaker with a magnet driving the diaphragm, but in reverse. This explains how you can actually use some headphones as a terrible microphone, but I digress. I do that a lot. Condensers, condenser microphones, on the other hand, use electronics to measure and transmit electric signal variance. So if you need to capture the fine, breathy details of a voice, like in storytelling, even the least sensitive condenser is going to be more sensitive than the most than most dynamic microphones. Plus, the electronics and condensers boost the signal level immediately as the sound is captured. Now, it takes a lot of air to move the relatively thick diaphragms in dynamic microphones, resulting in a relatively sluggish response that some audios might call something called muddy. There are also ribbon microphones, but they're weird, fragile, rare, and stupid expensive, so do yourself a huge favor and just ignore those for now. Shure SM7B, SM58, EV's RE20 and RE320 are all excellent, popular, dynamic mics. They're used mostly in live radio or performance situations where fine detail really isn't necessary. You're not telling, we could tell stories on the radio, but not as critical to have that feeling. 
No. Sennheiser's MKH-416 and most Neumann mics, including the TLM and the popular U87AI, are popular condenser mics used by many professional voice actors, singers, and producers. So people ask me all the time, well, what's more affordable? And it's always the dynamic. You can get a great dynamic mic for well under 500 bucks. Phantom power. You'll hear this. It's DC voltage to power a condenser microphone. Most modern mixers and audio interfaces include a 48-volt switch that sends power through your XLR cable, but we'll talk about that in a second. There's times where the use of an external phantom power supply is used. USB-powered condenser mics draw 5 volts of current directly from their USB connection, up to 5 volts. Now, speaking of plugs, we need to talk about that XLR cable. They're widely used to connect professional microphones to a preamp mixing board or to a digital converter, an analog to digital converter, or either way. Now, the XLR connector cable, also known as a Canon plug, you may hear that thrown around in old school conversations. It's a three-prong connector used in professional audio, video, and stage lighting equipment. They're everywhere. They're omnipresent. And they're used to transfer analog and digital instrument, microphone, or speaker audio, lighting controls, and also for that low-voltage power supply, that phantom power. They can have male and female ends, and I'm sure you can figure out which is male, which is female. So you'll need one or more of these cables as you get down the road into this field. Now, there's not really much difference in high-quality cables, but the extremely cheap ones can disconnect internally to, due to bad manufacturing or soldering or two thin wires that could overheat as they carry that 48 volts of phantom power to your condenser mic. So settle in the middle of the road with a, a name brand price-wise when you're shopping for cables. XLR cables are known as balanced cables, which basically means the signal they carry is shielded from most interference. So you'll get a cleaner sound with no hums, and especially at the longer distances. The shorter the length, the better, most people tell you. But don't go crazy. It's better to have a few extra feet than not enough. Some people will tell you 100 feet is the maximum length of an XLR cable before you begin to introduce interference. And others say it could be as much as 1,000 feet in some situations. I ran 50 feet in an attic in a house once over air conditioning and electric lines with no problem. So it depends on your situation. Now, XLR and balanced audio tech is really a lot more complex than that. And everything I'm talking about. So Google it if you need to know it all, if you're that type of person who really wants to know the infinite details about all this stuff. So let's talk about noise. Your noise floor is the amount of noise a room or piece of equipment naturally creates. We're talking air handlers, air conditioning units, computer fans, light hums, trucks, loud cars outside, nearby train tracks, airplanes going over your house or wherever you're recording, and all those kind of things can add undesirable noise that might end up in your recordings. What might seem inaudible during recording can easily end up as a distracting noise once it's enhanced or mastered. Most pro mics have such a low noise floor that you can barely hear them. Listen. That's my roof. My roof vents. It's very windy out there. Sometimes a condenser mic can make a subtle hum. You can hear it if you turn up the gain and listen closely, but it's basically inaudible for most purposes. What is a good noise floor for professional voiceover? Well, for most voiceover jobs, including Audible for audiobooks, you'll need to achieve something called a maximum of negative 60 decibel noise floor, which is honestly surprisingly noisy. Think a large electric fan blowing about 15 feet away. I'm actually amazed that Audible accepts that as a bottom line noise floor, because I think it's incredibly uh, annoying. But less is always better. My treated room here, listen. Nice, right? Now, anytime you're recording, it's a great idea to capture five seconds of dead air or room tone at the top or the tail of a take. This way you'll have enough data to feed into your noise reduction algorithm when you go or whoever is going to master your audio. So it'll know exactly what the room sounds like, and they can filter a lot of that noise out. So people ask, where should I put the mic? To get the best sound out of your microphone when speaking, you generally want to have it about at least three inches away. The closer to the microphone you get, you'll begin to notice something called the proximity effect. Now, in some cases in the world, starts Friday, rated R, you might want a, a more deeper, more breathy, intimate sound and a lot of boominess or distortion. So get up on it if that's what you're looking for. But you'll also get a lot more mouth clicks and pops and plosives that you'll need to fix in post. So this is about three inches away. Wow, I sound so normal and every day. 
And this is the proximity effect. In a world, in a time, in a place, there was proximity. Now, in noisy environments, you may need to reduce your gain, increase your voice, talk a little louder, and move a little closer to the microphone to reduce that noise floor, all that stuff going on in the background, the fans, and all that stuff. Otherwise, for a more natural, balanced sound and a decent sounding room, hang about three to six inches away. Everyone's a little different, so what works for Bob might not work for you. You might have a louder voice than Bob does, and he might be quiet, and you'll figure out where your sweet spot is. So let's talk about the business of microphones. Sometimes you have to pose. You got to do what you got to do to get in the door. You got to use what you got to get what you want. You, you use what you got to get what you want. Now, when you're recording your demos, especially, you can't, I'm not telling you where that's from. When you're recording your demos, especially on camera, use the most expensive mic you can buy or borrow. Producers are watching and some of the less experienced producers, well, your equipment is even more important than your voice. With that said, there are workarounds. So I told you earlier, I'm going to tell you what microphone I'm using. The Neumann U87 AI is known as the industry standard in the recording in recording studios all over the world for voiceover, for singing. I have a real one that costs upwards of $3,000. This one is a U87 knockoff. It cost me $250. And to be honest, I actually sound, I think it sounds better than my U87. It doesn't sound bad at all, right? So I hope you learned something. Leave some comments and questions below. Uh, I answer anything I can, or I can point you to uh, someone who can answer that question or an article or whatnot. But, you know, Google some stuff out there. Get out there. Make some money. Have a little bit of fun. And uh, I can't wait to hear your voice on the next big project. Thanks for watching.